Happy Friday, folks, and welcome to another episode of Plan A Conversation. So we are finally in season seven of Plan A Conversations, and thank you so much for all of your support. Because of you, we are now in 74 countries uh, with this work, and I cannot tell you how important that is and how exciting it is for me. Um, I haven't created this podcast a little bit over two years ago. And so uh, if you've been vibing out to the new music, uh, just so you know, that's by Tube Racker. Go ahead and check them out. Uh, that first song is entitled Mojo. So glad that they could uh, lend their expertise to us for this new uh, season. And so listen, I've been thinking about who can go ahead and kick off this incredible uh, conversation for season seven, uh, this sort of season of completion, and also just someone who um, I have known for quite some time uh, and who's been an inspiration. And I kind of feel like I've grown up, in essence, uh, from our Princess Seminary days uh, with this young brother. And so I want to welcome uh, Darnell Moore to the conversation. Welcome, D. I'm so happy to be here, Clay. I'm so happy to be in conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's been some just time. Like, oh, my gosh. 14 years? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> The crazy part about it all, and I want to get into uh, uh, Princess Seminary a little bit later, um, is I never said this to you, but I really have to thank you for um, allowing uh, me to fail big and to fail in very interesting ways during our time at Princeton Seminary. Like you were this mirror for me in so many different ways. And I think seminary for me has was this just this growing, this evolutionary period. And just to have that level of support and that brotherhood that I found in you, honestly, in <laughs> in very interesting ways on Prince. I, I just cannot thank you enough for that, man. Wow. Uh, listen, we were in that <laughs> in that work together. It was a work. Yeah. <laughs> All things, all things. (laughs) And so right now, I'm curious to know, did you imagine your life to be what it is right now and and all the things that you're doing and things that you're creating? You know, what's so funny, I have always been a dreamer. Mm -hmm. I'm an Aquarius. So, you know, I've always had sort of big, audacious um, visions, dreams, aspirations. And I've always say that I sort of dreamt my way, imagined my way into, prayed my way into mm. the various um, various things I've been able to do in life. What's interesting, though, I had a I had a sense of um, of of a life, a sense that there were things for me to do, mm-hmm. and a sense that um, there would be some positive reward or um, not reward in a sense of like a giving, but um, that I'll be able to sort of do the type of things that I would fall in love with. I knew mm-hmm. that much, but I never saw exactly what that would be. You know, um, I'm talking to you from like LA. Um, I didn't imagine myself ever living on the West Coast. I'm from Camden, New Jersey, um, mm-hmm. a East Coast person who is very much like hood and from the, street, <laughs> from the streets. <laughs> um, and living and working in Hollywood, um, yeah. And I I didn't see that coming. What I did know is that I was s- supposed to do the work that was that was presented to me and do it with fidelity and do it with care and do it with love and do the work in such a way that it can have an impact. And inevitably, that work, if you do it well and if you do it with care and if you do it with passion, will um, will make way for you, will make a room for you. That's what, what I believe. Um, so I'm 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 always in shock, and which is why I, I stay like really humble by the many ways. Like um, I don't know, the universe has shown out in terms of allowing me to do things that I just never even imagined I'll be doing. Like I I you know, yeah, I'm sitting in Hollywood. Like what what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And and just for our audience, uh, Darnell uh, is the director of inclusion strategy for content and marketing at Netflix. And one thing Darnell does really just uh, was very curious for me as a reader and somebody who has sort of grown up in essence um, with you is your book, No Ashes and the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. Um, That young boy from Camden, New Jersey, to find himself in the place and spaces that he is now. How did you, how did you get there? What's so funny to me is that whenever I um, find myself inhibited by fear, Mm. I think of that to that, to that young being. Um, Mm. I was very, still very much a dreamer, very audacious, probably a bit more courageous than I am now as Mm. an adult. Um, You know, when I was in eighth grade, I write about, um, going into my guidance counselor's office, Ms. Yaldell. Um, it was the second semester of my eighth grade year in middle school. And I was upset that some of my classmates were being pulled out of my class, social <laughs> studies and reading and language arts to go to some little, you know, um, to the academically talented um, section of the course. Hmm. But I wasn't. So I took my my report cards and my test scores to her office. That Your was receipts. 13 out of 14. <laughs> and uh-huh. knocked on her door. I will never forget it. She had pearls on, her little jerry curl. Mm. She's like, come in there now. What do you want? And I said, I want to know why I'm not in academically talented classes. And she was like, huh? I was like, I have my test scores right here. And, you know, I got a 12.9, which meant I was like testing at a 12th grade level. And here are my test scores. And why is Richard and Lawrence getting pulled out to go to Ms. Campos' class, but not me? And she <laughs> changed my, that day, put me, sent a transfer slip and put me in academically talented. I ended up graduating, winning the, like, the prize uh, for the top performing student in mm. academically talented for like social, whatever the course is. Um, even only being there for two semesters. Now, also that year, I had another teacher who said to me, she told me I couldn't write well. And she said it out loud in front of my classmates. She was a white woman. Mm-hmm. And I was like, mm-hmm. I'm going to show her. <laughs> show her ass. So um, she was also responsible for helping young people get into private schools, one of which was Morristown Friends. Um, Friends schools are Quaker schools, Quaker private schools. And I didn't know this, but... Um, because she said that to me and because she barely helped me um, and I tried to test into this private school but didn't get in. So I went into the phone book, again, the same grade, found a school, Mulligan Hills Friends School. All I needed to know that the name Friends was in it and called the school, acted like my mother, got them to send me an application, <laughs> filled the application out, filled, I wrote my mom's essays, forged her signature, long story short, got into the school. Um, so I would do things like that. As a yeah. young kid, right? So it makes sense to me that that um, I don't know what I, what to what to even call it. I mean, maybe a bit of a, a bit of magic, a bit of queer magic, a bit of um, not even self empowerment, but this desire to never allow others' barriers <laughs> to become mm. the walls yeah. that keep me stuck. Um, yeah because of their limited imagination. And so today I think back to that little me Hmm. who, you know, in a lot of occasions found voice um, in impossible circumstances. Yeah, And I pull from that today um, as an adult who often needs that young juvenile uninhibited courage to move Mm -hmm. through many aspects of my life now. Yeah. I get that question so many times from listeners and just from clients in general is, where do you find that level of courage? Where does that sort of come from? And people always say, if you weren't born with it, courage is something that cannot be learned. And so what do you say to people who don't have these stories of maybe your sense of childhood, youth courage? And <laughs> and what, what do you say to them? Because the, I hear this just way too much. Yeah, I, I, I think... One of the things I always push back when writing that book was I never wanted this to be a story that was somehow understood as, um, you know, like the the story of this this particular young person who has some stuff, um, some some courage, let's call it, some hope, some sense of sort of self awareness that other people cannot possess. Um, uh. I, 
I think it's really important to to do away with those type of narratives. Um, courage, um, hope, faith, uh, those things can be learned. They can be grown. They can be uh, stretched. Um, our imaginations can be stretched. And one of the ways that we can tap into the potential for growth in those areas is to pay attention to how to other people's stories. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if anything, I don't think I just woke up one day with like a type of passion or courage that was, wasn't pre- presented um, that I didn't get to see in other people around me. You know Got what I'm it. saying? Like yeah. I had access to people. Um, and when I didn't have access to them, I was, a, I read the newspaper. I was a, a, a person who was reading the world. Um, and I think that there are ways that we can learn anew. We can become anew. And one of the routes for that are, are looking at examples um, around us. If Even if we're not following the same paths, there's something to be said about harnessing the energy that we see other people mm. putting forth in their life. And I think that that's a fair thing that all of us can do. Yeah, that's right. Uh, like, look to your neighbor, look to what other people are doing to inform what you hope to to become and what you want to do. And so, Darnell, how would you define your purpose and call in the world? What What does that represent for you? How do you explain that? It's to... I'm uncomfortable with injustice. Mm. I know that. I am... Um, I feel that I've been doing work, at least over the last two decades, that has allowed me to bring people who have traditionally been kept out, locked out, underrepresented, forgotten, muted, invisibilized, Um, whether they be Black and Black and working poor or queer and trans and non-binary folk, um, whether they be disabled folk, people who exist um, because of the selfishness and greed of, of cultures that demands that only some people can be in the center. I like to say it's the people who exist on the edges of the edges of the edges of the margins that I'm committed to ensuring have a space in which they can not only give voice um, and live their lives, um, but a space where they have access to resources. They have access to safety. They have access to life um, and access to the imaginative capacity, Mm. right? Um, To dream into being the various ways, the various things that that they want to be in the world, right? Like, other than just like a laborer for something, um, <laughs> I want a world where people can imagine beyond the const- constrictions of like the mighty dollar or capitalism um, to be. I just want people to be. So I would say my calling is to aid in that process, whatever that might be. And and I think mm-hmm. I've been able to do work that allows me to use different, to to approach that in different ways, whether that's in media. Mm-hmm. And I get to do media and go in these places and say, well, you know, you all talk about <laughs> Black folk, <laughs> but I'm going to talk to them and give mm-hmm. them space for them to talk on our own terms. Or, um, you know, it, whether that is sort of like within whatever the space, within a publishing environment, you know, um, if it's organizing, if it's policy work, if it's mm-hmm. program design, if it's me working within an entertainment industry. It's it's me constantly asking the question, who are we keeping away from the table? And right. what are we going to do to make sure that they get here? That's my work. Yeah. And um, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I'm really curious about, and I'm not sure if a lot of other people know uh, even the story, how did you find your way to seminary? Was that <laughs> something that <laughs> was on your trajectory at one point? Did you feel called? How did that How did that happen for you? Because I know I get a lot of time people say, you went to seminary? I know. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, until they meet you and until they spend yeah. time with you and then they're like, sure. okay, it makes perfect sense. Um, I got it. <laughs> I interesting enough, it's funny. I um just this week was interviewed by a writer from that's doing a like a short brief for for PTS, and it's interesting. I'm like I've really talked to nobody from the school <laughs> so long. Um, <laughs> um, but what I, I bring that up because one of the things I said on that call is you know I was really interested in doing that piece because I wanted people at particularly at PTS at Princeton Seminary to know 
that the articulation or at least the materialization of one's call doesn't always have to be parents ministry. I see my work as service. I see my work as ministry. And I want people to see that your work that you do as possibilities for us in ways that we were not allowed or given access to when we were there. That's right. Um, But that said, you know, before I got to seminary, I knew I was going into pulpit ministry, right? Like I was parish ministry. I'm like, I'm, that's what I, you know, I'm like, I I preach, uh, you know, Bible study, (laughs) this is like what it is. Uh, you know, I was a member of a 20,000 uh, member church at the time. I went into seminary, fully enmeshed into the culture of the church, um, a church boy, um, and went into seminary thinking, <laughs> the funny part is, because <laughs> I'm, I'm an Aquarius, y'all, I told you I'm an Aquarius, so I'm like, you know, we had the Bible Institute at my church, and I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to the Bible Institute. <laughs> If I'm going to go to school, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I need to be able to get a bona fide degree so I can come back here and teach y'all that's supposed to be giving us <laughs> from the original language, you know? So, <laughs> so I was like, I'm not going to your Bible Institute. Get out of here. Uh-huh. Um, but it, so I went thinking that I was being prepared to go back right into. Um, into parish ministry. I thought right. I was going to go back to my church and yeah. help them redo their curriculum and, you know, give them some yeah. real exegetical tools <laughs> <laughs> other than what they had. And I left seminary and left my church <laughs> and left the entire institution. <laughs> Darnell, my so family then, said to me, what happened to you? I went to school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I am so grateful. And I, I just left the session with my therapist who said to me, you know, as I'm listening to you talk, it makes sense. It's like, I, and I can never find this word, but it's like seminary um, helps you to become contemplative. Mm. I was like, yeah. you know, what? that's it. Because mm-hmm. like, and that is, and it's a gift because you've been able to, you, you may not see how that's been effectual to the works that you do. Mm-hmm. But it is. It's made me contemplative, um, a deep, deep thinker, a critical reader of the world, a critical reader of text, whatever those texts mm-hmm. might be, right? Um, and I'm so grateful for it. I actually left seminary understanding that my call, my call was clarified. Mm-hmm. I'm actually living in the reverberations of that call even today, mm-hmm. and I'm, um, I'm so grateful for that. As are you. As are yeah. you, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Um, so that seminary wasn't for naught, you know. It 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 produced. It, we are who we are. I think we're exactly where we're supposed to be, um, and some of that has much to do with the tools that we gain that I gained from from my seminary training. Yeah, and one of the big reasons why I wanted to speak with you is because so many people think that there is this very traditional and very linear path that you take after seminary. And there's people like me and you who are doing some really in- incredible, interesting things. So post-seminary, what did you do? What was life <laughs> like for you? I was like, oh my gosh, I need a job. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to the church at all. What's funny is even when I was in seminary, I told our field ed supervisor, who was so upset at me. He's like, you know, what should, he named an all the black churches, Shiloh. He named it, you know. And I'm like, I ain't going, I'm not going to none of them churches. I'm not going to a church. He's like, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> I said, I want to go to a public policy think tank. <laughs> he was like, you can't, that's not, you can't graduate, go to, and I was like, y'all need to do something. You got to be better. Yeah, that's right. So I went to the Center for, I think, Center for American Progress, I think the name, or Center for Public, I can't even remember the name, but I went to D.C. and did field, my first field placement for the summer in a public policy think tank. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and then I did my full year in a reformed church of America, um, which I'm grateful for. But I went right out of there um, into um, the back into the nonprofit space. I, I started, I became the director of um, a few, few group homes and a, a youth assisted living facility in Camden. Mm. Um, and I was first, I was there as a, ther- as a ther- adolescent therapist. Uh, but then I became a director. I was 27 running like these mm. three homes with young people who were probably 10 years, my senior, um, 
responsible for their care. They were like wards of the state. Right. Um, and from there, I went into sort of nonprofit space, working as like a, I was doing statistical analyses. Um, at some point, I ended up at the, like the United Way as um, a, a director there, granting funds to organizations in uh, North Jersey. Uh, then I went on to be a founding director of uh, a, a education research office. Mm-hmm. Um, That's right. Newark and between Newark Public Schools and Rutgers. And then I went on to uh, take on a role of, a, of developing a high school uh, under the name of a black 15 <laughs> year old lesbian who was killed in Newark. Her name was Sakia Gunn, and I was developing a high school named after her that never opened because of some pushback from a variety of different corners. Um, but at that time, at the, the parallel to that, I was doing a lot of work within the communities that I was in, um, organizing work um, in Newark, particularly in New Jersey, and had developed something of a public presence, which mm-hmm. is how I got the media, because I would initially get tapped to just give commentary and I was writing and, in, in you know, in various uh, media outlets and didn't even intend to be in media, but because I have been doing all this work and sort of my face and, na- and words showing up, um, and then the movement for Black Lives happened, of which I was part, I sort of skipped right into an editorial role in a media brand. <laughs> like, how did this happen? You know, um, and ended up in right dead center in media, which is how I get to sort of media and entertainment world. So it's been an interesting journey. It's been an interesting when did journey. You- when did you know that you were a writer? Like, when did that, like, that feeling come to you? Oh, my gosh. I was, I won my first writing contest at 14. At 14, I was doing the most, as y'all can see. I was out here to prove my teacher wrong. <laughs> she told me I could write. I was like, okay, I'm going to get you. Um, so I, I have won an, a, sit, the school poetry contest, and then they would take the school's winner and put you against all of your peers across the city and I won. Mm-hmm. And Sonia Sanchez was actually the guest speaker. Oh, that's my girl. At an event when they gave me the award and the mm-hmm. teacher that told me I couldn't write had to present me with that award. And it was then where I knew mm-hmm. that, and it was, I was writing something black too. It was like black, I don't even remember the words, but I just know it was like black power. I don't know, it was like black power. <laughs> but I was 14 and I sensed in that moment that there was something there. And two years, three years later, I had a um, a grammar teacher who would tell me all the time, it's like, you're a writer, mm. like you're a writer. But I never knew, you know, I wasn't taught. And, and this is something I always ask people to think about in terms of when you're thinking about vocations and what it is that you're called to do and what to do. Like no one ever gave me or talked to me about writing as an option for a professional career. Mm. And I remember fast forward, like getting a, fir- like, <laughs> Getting money. I was like, oh my God, you paying me with all these zeros behind it for like <laughs> my words? What? Right. You mean to tell me that's all I had to do all mm-hmm. this time? And yeah. like I began to make a substantial living. Mm-hmm. I left all of these spaces and just started work writing and was like, mm-hmm. good. And I was like, you know, not not for the sake of just it being um the thing that was both feeding um it was feeding my spirit and my stomach. And that was like, this is what I t- is something I tell people when you're looking for, or trying to determine what you're supposed to do. Yeah. When a thing is, it's, I've done stuff that fed my stomach. I ain't doing those things no more, right? Yeah. Um, but when a thing feeds both your stomach and your spirit, you know you're doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And that's what writing has been for me on this part of my life. Like I, I get stunned still like, damn, you pay, you're paying me for words? Yeah. You know, it's amazing, amazing thing. Wow. Words that I love to write, you know? Yeah. And so what do you say to other young Black boys out there who uh, have this feeling of being the underdog in a lot of capacities and told that you can't do this and you can't do that? What, 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 where do they start to have a sense of confidence in themselves to begin those steps? Um, it's so... That's such a great question. I, it's it's really hard to um, to silence or 
to not put more faith in the thoughts and words and ideas of others who might be perceiving us. <clears throat> mm. It's just hard to do that. It's, it, it takes a lot of a lot of courage, a lot of strength, especially as young people who are still growing into versions of themselves who are coming of age. So much of how we understand ourselves is shaped by our environments. Um, but I would say that if I were talking back to my younger self, I would say to him, keep pushing against the no's, the I can't, you can't, you won't. Um, keep um, pushing against every story that is written within media that says that young people like you who come from cities like Camden, um, who are Black and we're living in working poor neighborhoods or single parent homes or in any type of situation where our narrative has always been um, s- sort of subjecting us to the I can't and you won't mm-hmm. keep pushing against those things and to do the magical thing, the powerful thing of um, seeing in yourself that which others refuse to see in you. And I was a young person who, and I tell you know, I told you these stories, and I don't want to name myself as something different, um, because I think every young person in my school, and should have and could have walked into Miss Yeldell's room and affirmed who they are. That's everybody's right, right and everybody's gift. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say we can exercise that. And the other thing I would say is all the things that I was um, picked on for, the things that I was sort of like corralled, people laughed, are actually the things that have been a greatest benefit to me as an adult. I got laughed at for being a nerd and a geek. And yeah. now I get to like, that is what I do in the world. You know what I mean? Ain't that something? The, the color <laughs> of my skin, the size yeah. of my lips, the, the the manner, the way I move my hand, like those are now the very things that have been foundational mm. to who I become and what I do. So the last thing I'll say is, all of those things that others may um, use um, to sort of to, to dog somebody out, yeah, to debase them, um, to make them feel less than, to you know, may, might very well be the, the the gifts and tools that they will be pulling from as mm-hmm. adults moving through the world, and that's yeah. the gag. Yeah. That's the yeah. Gag. Because <laughs> I look at my, my, my all of my classmates, they're like my friends on like Facebook and all these things. I'm like, y'all liking my page now, but I remember, I, you up in here now, up in the in the comment section. But I remember, you know, and the very things that you might have laughed at. That's right. That's same right. things you was laughing at. My queerness. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You now liking a post of me on a, on a magazine or something talking about queerness when you was laughing at me when I was 14. Look at, look at how the universe works. So I would say, hold on a, just a little bit to where you can mm. at least see how the very things that others have tried to use against you be setting you up for success. Wait and see it. Wait and see it. And when you got that call and that sort of transformation uh, to shift into Hollywood, what was that like for you? And what was that process like for you? Um, <laughs> it was funny. It was funny it's because, I, you know, I have a, uh, it's funny. I was, uh, this is such a, I guess, a lesson too, in terms of timing, but I had um, finished a book and had desires to move into, I've always been a media maker and mm-hmm. had done, you know, put out some content to the world and I wanted to do, like I wanted to be in a writer's room and I wanted to explore other aspects of the, my career, but didn't know how to get there. Hmm. Didn't know how to get there. Had people there, but I still didn't know how to get there. You know what I'm saying? And certainly I'm like, I wasn't asking anybody for help. I could have, but I didn't. And I had a friend, Dream Hampton, who said maybe three years ago, like, you need to be, you need to have a show. You need hmm. a show. And I was like, cause I, you know, was doing dabbling in that. And I was like, I guess. He's like, you should just move to L.A. I, if you move to L.A., you it, I, people, I'm telling you, they would take to you. Um, I think it would be very easy for you. Um, and I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it three years ago. But I went. Three years goes by. Everybody around me, like, moving to L.A. Everybody getting these, they get booked book to film and, like, 
writer's room. I'm sitting here like, how are y'all doing this? Like, <laughs> I, I, my people that I don't, still don't know how to get there. Um, but I kept working. I stayed, I, I took on a job. I got off my book tour and um, took on leading a nonprofit in New York called Breakthrough US hmm. um, that uses um, media art and technology to shift how we think about gender, gender based violence human rights issues. And I was like, I'm going to do this work. <laughs> Go back to this nonprofit. And um, I was I was doing that work with care and with love. And again, with this nagging thing in the back of my mind, it says there's something else for you to do. And in the midst of that, my friend, Wade, who I had developed a consultancy practice with some side paths, called and said, hey, I'm at Netflix now. And um, they need somebody to come and do this work this inclusion and diversity work with their content team. And uh, and surprisingly, guess what I was doing at the time? I was running an organization of content creators, um, both based here and in India. Um, so, you know, I was doing all of this work anyway, um, and I had been doing all this work. So hmm. in some ways, that three-year lag allowed me another opportunity to get gain more access to knowledges that would be necessary mm. for the job that they would call mm. me to do. I got that call maybe three weeks later. I got an offer, not even mm. three weeks, maybe two weeks. And it was like, <laughs> it was like, okay, um, we're moving you to LA. Wow. Um, and, and my partner and I packed up our stuff and moved here October, 2019. Um, and I jumped into work maybe I moved on a Thursday, jumped into work on a Monday. Um, so there was a lesson in there for me that sometimes our timing for things mm. is often skewed by the timing and sort of uh, the the sort of movement of other people who are running alongside us. Right. Um, but if we remain laser focused, you know, like I could have moved here three years ago, um, but I'm certain that... Um, I would my move here would have just been a different thing. Um, yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yeah, totally. Certainly would have had not not the support of a company to literally move me across the country. Certainly wouldn't have had that. You know, mm -hmm. I got here and had <laughs> temporary living, housing um, available to me for three months. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm like, not only did I get the thing, but I got it with like mm -hmm. exorbitant blessing. Yeah. I, so it's this is the the difference in sort of like really being keen with timing is you can get good or you can get what's great, and I'm That's glad right. I got what was great. <laughs> yeah, and another part, Darnell, that I get all the time in questions around two things: how do you ask for help, and then how do you develop friendships and strategic partnerships where it doesn't seem like you're always asking, asking, asking when you're in need. Yeah, the first thing I'll say to that is, um, don't be afraid. I, I I say be unafraid to ask for not just help, but the hows, the whats, the whens. I am often um, deeply impressed by people who who know how, who have the gift to ask. Mm. Um, I don't think there are many times where I've asked people for something where people said no, but those those times where I ask have been so far and few between. <laughs> <laughs> right. That is probably like, oh, he, you know, um, mm -hmm. but there's also, I also want to say that there are also people who exist in the world and in our lives and in our spaces who are in position and have a desire to help. That's right. That's right. And there, so there's that, like I, you know, I got a book, I tell the story all the time. I got an agent. Because, and I was surrounded by, I'm a writer. I was surrounded by writers, writers who have books. Ain't nobody was telling me how to get an agent. I know how to find one. But mm -hmm. I went to one of my um, one of my friends and said, hey, I need an agent. And he said, I got, okay, I have a, an agent for you. One of, the, one of the students, yeah. my students that I taught is an agent in New York. That's how I got my agent, right? Like mm -hmm. I asked. Um, so, you know, I, I Yes, don't be afraid to ask. And also, I, I think there is to carry this idea that there are people in our lives who are strategically set up um, to possibly be the link that we need to the next thing that we need to be doing. 
Yeah, amen. I, I received that, and I hope that the listeners and viewers are do, receiving that as well. Um, before I let you go, because I want to respect your time, I know we have a, a hard stop. Uh, one thing that uh, is very, very important to this podcast, especially to the listeners, is they are always thirsty for understanding people's spiritual practice mm. to not only support them in their day to day, but also that spiritual practice to help them get to their purpose, to help them mm-hmm. maximize, you know, those results. What is your spiritual practice and how has that sustained you in uh, opportunities and also in difficult times? Yeah, I um, I have been committed to grounding myself in, um, in sort of ancestral energy and spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, there is nothing that I am able to do and able to do right, able to do with courage, able to do with love, um, that does not come anchored in um, my prayers, uh, my deep connection to spirit, and and um, literally, like I did a call right before I talked to you, a panel, and I had to shut the video off and literally pray. And, um, and, and this is, this is like, there's no word that can come out of my mouth, um, that can land with the type of power that can land with the type of grace and care. Um, if, if those words are not, um, grounded, yep. And the, in the sort of sense of what is right, um, what is good in the world, what can bring about a good. And for me, that means spirit, that means spirit, that means spirit, that means ancestors. And, and I'm not, I don't see myself as disconnected from that. Um, and it is a, this, it, it has to be spirit has to be part of whatever decisions I make in terms of my career. And, um, from the words I write on a page of a book, I mm-hmm. literally sit there before I write and say that this has to come, um, and be produced in such a way that it can have impact, and that can only happen if if it's spirit breathed. Amen. If it's spirit breathed, brother, listen. I appreciate this time that you have come to just bless us with your experience and with also. This has been just a catch up for me and you, <laughs> which has been really good. <laughs> I mean, t- time time is is, is of time essence, is, and there's so yes. much is happening. You you're in the West Coast, I'm in the East Coast, but I cannot thank you for this time. But I know before I let you go, what are you working on right now that's exciting mm. you? I know you have an upcoming book. Yeah, what's going on there. Uh, right, I just got a note from my publisher. Like, what's up? My agent was like, "Come on with it, <laughs> run us our pages." So I have the second book. <laughs> That is tentatively titled Unbecoming, Visions Beyond the Limits of Manhood um, that mm-hmm. I'm working on. And mm-hmm. a podcast that exists in the world, the first season is um, 10 episodes called Being Seen. Um, that's, it's a, a, I love doing that work. We're about to start mm-hmm. season two. Um, so those are two things that I'm working on now. And supposedly starting a new column on love for Ebony Magazine. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. So there's some things I'm doing that to, to feed my creative my, my creative hungers. All right. I love that, Darnell. And before I let you go, where can we learn more about you and be able to connect with you and your work? I am on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. I'm, I don't use them as much as I used to. <laughs> as as I used to. <laughs> but it's all more Darnell. Um, that's the sort of username on all of those spaces. And uh, would love to be in touch with folks if they want to reach out. Clay, right. thank you for having me. I'm so proud of you. So uh, and excited for all that you're go, going to do. Thank you, friend. Thank you, friend. I, I really appreciate it. And literally, I feel that exact same sentiment towards you. Um, listen, I'll have all of Darnell's information at the base of the podcast. You can learn more about me by visiting clayswilliams.com. And I'm on all of your favorite social media by the handle of at Plan A with Clay. Thanks. I look forward to seeing you in the very next episode of Plan A Conversations.